Well, once again, we are here um, together. This has uh, been weighing in on my heart pretty heavy. And in doing so, um, we're going to just pretty much um, enlighten each other. I want to challenge everyone to actually get into the Word of God. You have to get into the Word of God. Now, if you don't believe this book, that's fine. Then you, there's no need for you to get into it. If you want to know him for yourself, up close and personal, because he will talk to you, get in the book. There's nothing I'm going to say today that is not in the book. But I am going to address a few issues. And this is only my last time addressing these issues. Because, again, if anyone have any any issues with what's being said or what's being given, then by all means, contact me. And we'll sit down and we will reason together. There's no reason why we can't reason together. But I am going to address a few issues uh, on some things once again, brought to my attention. I wrote them down so I, I wouldn't get off track. Um, there's a comment made by an individual uh, who I believe should know better uh, by being placed in a position of authority in the Christian dome. You should know better. You should know that you cannot play, twist, bend scriptures. You can't do that. You do not have the authority to play, bend, or twist scriptures for your own personal gain, agenda, or assignment you were set out to do. What you can do is tell the people the truth. And right now, um, based on all the things you said and all the things you did and all the yelling and the hooting and the hollering, you still did not validate what you were doing. It was a lot of hooting. It was like a pep rally or something. I don't know. But, you know, I only heard it. I, I wasn't present. I only heard the message. But uh, you didn't validate what you were doing. And you were there to install someone, but you did not validate it. But as a person that wears a collar or a yoke, you should know better. And so you misrepresented God, misinterpreted the scriptures, and misled many. So you're held accountable for that. One thing I will not do is mislead anyone. I'm going to give you the word. And the word is simple and it's plain. That's why God said it confounds the wise. It, it, it makes them trip, for lack of a better word. You can't take a verse of scripture, and we're going to talk about this, and then snatch out the top part of it and then attach it to something else. You can't do that. No. You have to, if there's a verse of scripture, you have to have that scripture and it has to be attached with what's being said. And you have to go back to the there and then. And you have to understand the people that were being talked to. You know, and actually the time and how it's relevant for today. You can't take a piece of it, move it to another verse of scripture and then validate your agenda. But I'm going to deal with that. I really don't care about agenda. And again, I have nothing against anyone. This is my last time dealing with this. I'm going to deal with it more than next. We're going to be moving on to who Christ is. Because that's what the people know. Who is this Christ that I believe in? And that's what we're going to deal with on the next video. But right here, <clears throat> you know, there's a lot of cliches. A lot of cliches. And... Um, I just don't even care to get into the cliches. I just want to get right down to the meat of the matter about uh, how a person did not choose themselves. And this was God's doing. Okay, 
validate how God did it. You say it's God's doing, then where did God say it? How did God do it? Because still, well, you still got the law of first reference and God would never contradict scripture. So how did God do it? Um, then we move into, yeah, I just have bullet comments. I'm going to hit these bullets and then I'm going to dive right into scripture. This is the Lord's doing. And I had, this is what the individual said. This is the Lord's doing and I have the words to prove it. Okay, when you say the words to prove it, I'm looking for a Bible. Because you got my attention now. I'm on the edge of my seat. You got the words to prove it. Prove it. There's no word that came to prove. There's no word that followed you. That came back to prove anything. Actually, um, I'm heartbroken. Not over the fact of all the foolishness, but I'm heartbroken that someone would actually, that's supposed to be, supposed to be seasoned in the word, would actually come and bend and twist scripture and the revelation of the scripture for an agenda. And I don't care who you are. I don't care what you got around your neck. I don't care what title you got in front of your name, in front of it or behind it. You're wrong. You're wrong. This is called nothetic counseling. Kind of like what Paul did when he was dealing with Peter. This is foolishness. And I'm not dealing with it anymore, but this is foolishness. You said you had word to prove it, but the word and the scriptures that you've rambled off, that you've rambled off a lot and you did a lot of yelling and a lot of hollering, but there was no substance. Because at the end of the day, <laughs> as funny as it may be, there was a young man that went here not a young man. I mean, when I say young, he's in his, what, uh, 60s or whatever. He's still young. He's young. As far as I'm concerned, he's young. And didn't didn't get anything. All I, all I can say was, I got a lot of, quoted a lot of scripture. That was it. And the question, was, did you write them down? People are going to church not even writing down what's being said to even come back to qualify or check it. To, to make sure it's there in their book. You're like, you're just going somewhere and just believing everything you hear. You might as well be like, what was that, with Jim Jones, whatever, that, that punch, and just make everybody drink the punch and just pass out. Because you don't know the word for yourself, and you don't know God for yourself. And that's a sad, 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 sad connotation. So there was no word to follow. You saying this is the Lord's doing. I would dare to say this is the Lord allowance. There's nothing that goes on in this world, anywhere in this world, that God doesn't already know about. And I can't say God is smiling at this or God is, is winking at it or whatever because of ignorance. The only thing I can say is God allowed it to happen. This is God's allowance. It doesn't mean he permitted it. It doesn't mean his seal is upon it. It is what he allowed. Now, I'm going to say some things and, you know, some folks are going to be all emotional and, and with their feelings, but don't be emotional. Just be, just be in the word. Because if you're in the word and you follow the word, then you'll understand everything that I'm saying. It's not hard. It's right here, ground level. But this is God's allowance. The next thing is, you know, again, more cliches. Like I said, I have bullet comments based on what the young man said. More cliches. And then it was said that the uh, leader of the house had taught them that God calls women preachers. And it was repeated like over and over and over and over again. He taught us. He taught us. Okay. Here's my thing. There's a lot of things I was taught growing up. Some of them good, some of them bad, some of them true, some of them false. But as I grew and I began to understand, I began to search things out for myself, I understand that some of the things that I was taught were not true. 
Now that's disappointing when you get to that place like, man, that wasn't true. Just because someone taught you something and you have a relationship with that individual or you have a love for that person, it's okay to agree to disagree. It doesn't make this factual because you were taught something for X amount of years. But it does. They were probably sincere, but they were sincerely wrong. I'm going to prove it. it. Doesn't take away the love. Doesn't take away the friendship. Doesn't take away any of that. But they they miss God. And people acting like we're putting people on pedestals as if they can't miss God. I don't care if you're in a leadership position. I don't care if you got a collar around your neck. I don't care if you're prominent on television, whatever the case may be. You can miss God. Don't say you can't miss God. If this right here, you were taught this, then you were taught an error. Because he missed God. Now, some personal things I know that I will not share because I know this to be true. I don't think it. I know it to be true. But again, and then there's another bullet point here. People that don't understand where we are in God. This was, this was all given by that individual. People that don't understand, let me pray for you. But what is there to understand when you have the Word of God? What is there to understand when you know the Word of God? What is there to understand even if you don't know the Word of God and you're seeking the Word of God? God will reveal everything to you. You just ask God to give it to you. Open my eyes of my understanding, God. Give this to me. Not my revelation, not my interpretation, but exactly what you meant for me. This is what this is all about. This is not about agenda. But again, um, for those who don't understand what agenda is, when you got to pump, push, pull, and, and try to get things on board, you never have to do that. Never, 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 never. I've been coaching for a lot of years. And I'm, I'm just talking about in the, in the arena of football. I've been coaching for a lot of years, number one. One thing I don't do, I don't make anyone do anything. Either you want to do it or you don't. Either you come and understand the program or what we, what we have to offer, but you don't. You don't have to grab people, push them, pull them, get on board, stay, stick. You ain't got to do all that crazy stuff. Either you're going to do it or you're not. It's that simple. God adds to. God adds to. God adds to. Not man. It's God. And it's the word of God that sticks the hearts of men and then there's another bullet don't argue about what you know God said if people are in doubt or people have questions then they can't know something that means they're unsure they don't know so you can't make someone know something if they're unsure in a place of uncertainty this is foolishness. Did God say it? That was a question that was coming. Did God say it? Did God say it? Did God say it? And my question to you are, did God say it? Or did you say it? God is not a liar. I totally agree with you. He's not a liar. Not a liar at all. But I do want to address uh, something else because there's a lot of like subliminal messages just like that was all through that. One was dealing with a table, and uh, a wedge had to be put up under it. I know who that message was for, but a wedge was put up under it, and this was the revelation of the, nothing could sit on a table or it would fall, spill, or waste over. And that message was for a particular individual in reference to, you're not stable enough for what's going to be placed on the table. And so this is why you don't have it, because you're not stable. Hmm. There's a lot of 
I'll say again, because I don't want to be before you guys long. I'll say again, there's a lot of questions that could be asked, but it's not about asking questions. It's about asking the right question. How is it? You know, now I understand how Jesus could say, how long must I be with you before you get this? Because none of us know the day, nor the hour, nor the time when we're going to leave unless God decides to share it with us and give it to us. I say, hey, Keith, I'm taking you home. Get your affairs in order. But basically right now, all my affairs should already be in order. So whenever God decides to take me, it's already in order. One thing I, I, I remember studying uh, a while back, and it was, uh, I believe it was Miles Monroe, about the baton and the passion of the baton. This man had his replacement 20 years. I think, like the first 10 years, he had, a, he had his replacement whenever God decided to take him out. And then he was going to appoint another replacement, a younger individual, if when if or whenever God decided to take the person out that he'd already placed. But the person he'd already placed had already been operating 20 years, even while he was a pastor. So how is it that you're not stable or able to hold the weight of the ministry? And you've been there so long. That's interesting. There's another thing, because I always listen to what people say. That was my one question. How, did, how is it that you are not stable? Then there is another question I have, um, but it's not for anyone because I already know the answer. And the basic thing is, how is it that a person can look out amongst people that's been with them for so long. I'm talking decades upon decades upon decades and not be able to find anyone with the heart of the ministry. I'm not talking about commoners or members or people that just out. I'm talking about people that's in the inner circle. How is it that none of you have the heart of the ministry? None of you. That's a travesty that you've been operating all this time and you never had the heart of the ministry. That's sad. I don't know how you felt. But I know how I felt when I heard that firsthand. That a person looked out amongst people 10, 20, 30 plus years and none of you had the heart of the ministry. That spoke volumes. But I don't think either you heard it or I don't think you, you know it. I don't think you even care. We cannot be in something for filthy lucre, security, or a place of familiarity to where everything, this is all I know. The same God that many people have been holding on to that was pushed out from this place that if you lose everything, you lose everything. As long as you have Christ, you got enough to start again. Why is it that there's fear in the hearts of the people? And there's fear. And some of you know I know because you've spoken. But your secret's safe with me. But it's okay. God is not a liar. Now, in Matthew chapter 5, these are some verse, verses of scriptures that were yelled out, screamed out to qualify what was going on. It's the 
totally sad because the top part of the scripture was used and then it bounced to the woman at the well. Then it bounced to Mary with the alabaster box. Then it bounced to the woman caught in the act of adultery. But none of the scriptures that were given have anything to do. Because there was, there was a point trying to be made here. None of those scriptures that were used have anything to do with what you were there to do, which was installed. What you wanted to do was build a foundation or a basis to actually, I would call it a floor of acceptance. Because you, when you talk, you talk fast. And everybody in there not getting it. And everybody in there is not buying the message to get it or eat it or dissect it. But therefore, Matthew chapter 5, you said Matthew chapter 5, verse 20 through 22. 20 is not where you really want to go. You really want to go to verse 21. So we're going to hit 21. Matthew 5, 21. I got two Bibles open here and, you know, different translations because they wanted to use different translations. And I may or may not use a different translation. 5 and 20, 21. Is, now, this is the part that's unskillful. Very unskillful. You got to know how to handle the word of God because the scriptures always harmonize. They never contradict. They always harmonize. They never contradict. Verse 21. Ye have heard that it was said. And it, then he stopped. Then it goes. Then he, that's all he said in verse 21. Ye have heard that it was said. And I'll even go to finish this sentence. By them of old time. Then you go, you drop down to verse 22 and said, but I say unto you. What was said in verse 21? You can't say you heard it was said and then you jump all the way to the woman at the well. Because the woman at the well is not in here in Matthew 21, 5, 21. That, Jesus is not talking about the woman at the well in, in Matthew 5, 21. What was he talking about in Matthew 5, 21? Read the whole scripture. Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, thou shalt not kill. Hmm. Jesus dealing with commandments now. I believe the sixth commandment right now. And whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. You can't say ye have heard. And then you say, you know, because women had no credibility in times past. Look, man. We know where we have progressed from. We know the times and dispensation. These are not stories. These are not. God put this stuff here for a reason. The Bible is true. And it's with. History is doing nothing but repeating itself over and over. There's nothing new under the sun. Verse 21 has nothing to do with a woman at a well, with a woman with an alabaster box, nothing to do with the rolling away of the stone of Mary getting a message saying, Go tell. If someone tells me, hey, look, I need you to go tell somebody something, I'm just a messenger. Go and tell. Hey, look, um, your dad wants you to come home right now because he got something he wants you to do. Okay. I don't believe you. Then you hear your dad's voice. Oh, well, your dad did say that. Look, let's not play with scripture. If you have an agenda, do your agenda. Don't use God. Or try to use God to validate what you're doing. You can't. It's impossible. You have heard that it was said by them of old time that thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. Then verse 22 says, But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. One, you have heard. 
commandments. And he said, but now I say unto you, concerning this commandment, concerning these things. I know what was said in times past, but now, see, you were trying to say in times past, this is the, but see, I know what was said then. And he said, but now I'm saying unto you. And so what I'm going to, I'm going to deal with all this and, and give the people what was actually going on in the dispensation in time back then. And then I'm going to actually uh, show you what you were trying to do. And then I'm going to show you what God said concerning that what you were trying to do. Because you have to answer for that. I, I, not me, that's you. I'm your brother. And I love you. But in verse 21, let me get another one. I might need my specs, I'm getting a little older. Put this thing back. But in verse 21, what you got to understand here is that Christ was proceeding to expound the law. I got my notes. Christ was Christ. Here he, he was proceeding to expound the law in a particular instance. I got to read my notes. He adds, nothing new, only limits the restraints and the permission which had been abused. And as to the precepts, shows the breadth, the strictness, and the spiritual nature of them. Now, in those verses, he explains the law according to the true intent and the full extent of it. And forgive my reading. Here's the commandment itself. It's just laid out, delivered to them in the old time. There are ancient laws, but of that nature as never to be antiquated nor grow obsolete. It's not obsolete. Killing is here forbidding and killing ourselves and killing anybody else or any others directly or indirectly or being any way accessory to it. The law of God, the God of life, is a hedge of protection by our lives. The exposition of this command, which the Jewish teachers contented themselves with, their comment upon it was, whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. Who know ever? We're dealing with the law of the commandment. However, the commandment was faulty, for it intimated that the law of the sixth commandment was only external and forbade no more than the act of murder and laid no restraints upon the inward lust. Christ was dealing with the inward lust from which wars and fighting come. This was indeed the fundamental error of the Jewish teachers, that the divine law prohibited only the sinful act, not the sinful thought. That's the exposition of verse 21. You didn't get all of that. All you got was, you have heard, Ye have heard the exposition of verse 22. Christ tell them that rash anger is heart murder. Whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause breaks the sixth commandment. Anger is a natural passion. There are cases in which it is lawful and laudable. But it is then sinful when we are angry without a cause. No just provocation. Just angry. Anger upon groundless surmises for trivial fronts. Without a cause. It's vain. It's vain. That's what Verse 21, 22 of Matthew chapter 5 is talking about killing law, sixth commandment. Nothing to do with a woman in the well. Nothing to do with anyone at the tomb with a stone being rolled away. Nothing to do with an alabaster box. That verse of scripture is that pretty much 
deals with that, but not verse 21, 22. Then there was 38. I got all my notes. There was 38 and 39. Once again, ye have heard. And then you jump down to 39. I said, but I say unto you. So verse 38 says, ye have heard that it hath been said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you, that ye resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on the right cheek, turn to him the other cheek also. They smite you on the right, turn you. This is what Christ is saying. There's my other notes. Yeah, this is verse... 38 and 39. I got my notes. Got a 30 and 39. Because I don't want to wanna get off track. I want to get this. I want to get in and out. You have heard of verse 38. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. Verse 39. But I say unto you that ye resist not evil. So now in these verses, the law of retaliation is expounded and observed. What the Old Testament permission was in case of injury. It was not a command that everyone should of necessity require such satisfaction. But they might lawfully insist upon it if they pleased. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. It was a direction and a restraint to such as mischief done to them that may not insist on a greater punishment. That is proper. It's not a life for an eye. It's not a limb for a tooth. But it, it observes proportion. Finger for finger, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, ear for ear, whatever the case may be. That's what verse 38 is saying. It's not saying anything about a woman in a well. It's not saying anything about a woman running, go and tell the disciples. It's not anything about an alabaster box. It's not anything about installation. It's not anything about ordination. It's not anything about any of that. That's what that's about. An eye for an eye. You gave verses of scripture that dealt with the commandments. This has nothing to do with installation, ordination, period. None of that. But you use them. You ain't use anything dealing with ordination, the oil or whatever. I mean, David, you know, or... Saul, anybody being anointed, anything. He used this, but it was for it was to prove a point. I got ye have heard, ye have heard, okay. But it was to prove a point. Point well taken. Uh, the last verse, I, I didn't really write all of them down because I knew where they were and I knew what they were all pretty much saying. Forty three and forty four. Forty three and forty four. Ye have heard, and then 44, I said, but I say unto you. And so there's only the top. If you go and read those scriptures, the only top part of those scriptures were used. The meat of the scripture was never, never given. Again, this is unskillful. This is actually taking bits and pieces, pairing it up with something, hopefully to, I guess, stir some folks up or get them on board with what's going on, or whatever the case may be. I don't know. But it is what it is. Ye have heard, verse 43, that it, that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, pray for them which despitefully use you, and persecute you. That's what that's saying. Nothing to do with installation. Nothing to do with ordination. Nothing to do with any of that. Nothing to do with any of that. Nothing. Again, law of first reference. Law of first mentioning. If you can just grab a hold of that. Where has it ever been done in the Bible? Where was the first time it was done? in the Bible for the first time it was mentioned in the Bible those are the things you want to focus on 
when in the Bible have you ever, ever, I mean, read it, have you ever, ever seen a woman, a female, ordain a man? I don't care what anybody does. I don't care what anybody says. I don't care what anybody follow. What I do care about is the so-called elect mishandling, misinterpreting, and misleading. That's what I care about. And if you want to talk to me, pick up the phone. I'm more than sure you can get my number. It's not private. Call me. And if you want me to come to you, I'll fly to you. No qualms. But that's what happened. Misleading, misinterpretation, <laughs> and mishandling. Verse 43, verse 44. I think I wrote down the notes. I don't want to write any more notes. But we have here, lastly, the exposition of the great fundamental law. This is the great fundamental law. Thou shalt love thy neighbor, and by thy neighbor, they understood, the people back then only understood their neighbor as people they got along with, or people they liked. You know, or they were pleased to look upon as their friends. But they were willing to infer what God never designed. That's powerful. If I like you, you're my friend. If I don't like you, you're my enemy. That's crazy. Thou shalt hate thine enemy. And they looked upon that as whom they pleased. If you're my enemy, I hate you. My friend, we're cool. I like you, your friends. If I don't like you, I hate you, you're my enemy. This was a willing, corrupt passion to fetch a countenance for the word of God and to take occasion by the commandment to justify themselves. How many people are taking an occasion to, to get the scripture, mishandle it, misinterpret it, and mislead people? to justify themselves and what they're doing. That's a powerful verse of scripture right there. Powerful. See, we were told to love. Though they are our enemies, we must have a compassion for them, a good will toward them. This is what we're told. Where in those two verses of scriptures where it has anything to do with installation or ordination. It doesn't. Now I understand where you were going. Ye have heard, ye have heard, ye have heard. But I say unto you, but I say unto you, but I say unto you. You know, the one we call in the very act of adultery. Yes, we we know you can't commit adultery by yourself. I know I trust me, I know that. And nobody knows what was written in the sand. And no one should even speculate what was written in the sand. But once you have an encounter with Christ, wherever you are accusers, then go and sin no more. The accuser of the brethren will always be the devil. Let's love God enough not to play with the scriptures. We have to love him enough not to play with the scriptures. Ye have heard it said, but now I say unto you, so we took the tops of the scriptures and put them together. And then we took another verse of scripture and threw it right up under that one. I'm 
unskillful. Unskillful. Here's what I want to leave you with. And I pray that it's not even long. This is what I desire to leave you with. I got notes everywhere. You've referenced the term men and man. And man is anthropos, which means both male or female, it can be designated, or even all of the human race, regardless of the sex or the age. It could be a reference to species, it could be humanity or mankind as a whole, that's man. But when you use the term men, M-E-N, it's the plural. It's a noun. It's an adult male person which is distinguished between male and female boy or girl man or woman and man is a distinguished gender man both genders men single gender it's very it's distinguished There's a constant emphasis on this person who did not choose themselves. Regardless of who did the choosing, doesn't mean God did it. There was a constant emphasis on this is the Lord's doing. And there was word of scripture to prove it. You've given no scripture to prove it. I've laid out the scripture that you gave. The first part of the scripture of, of what you were saying, words we live by. Yeah. So, words we live by. Matthew 4, 4, Galatians 2, 20, Philippians. Words we live by. We went to 1 Corinthians 15. Prayer and quitting don't don't go together. Hebrews four and one. You know, <laughs> a lot of this stuff just it's just if people just read their Bible, they would they would say, what does it have to do with what was going on? It doesn't. God worked through women, and I thank God that He did. Because women are special. Special. They do more than we could possibly ever imagine for the next generations by teaching and playing that seed, that godly seed, and the children. And the older women, they are blessing because they teach the younger women how to be women. There's a problem when you have the older women in the flesh. They're in the church, but they're in the flesh. Yeah, like when they get a girl child, you know, all this other crazy stuff. Give them the word. Don't give them what you would do. Don't give them what you think. Give them the word. Lest you cause someone to slip, fall, and stumble. You know, someone asked me, where are those 40, 50 year marriages? They just don't exist anymore. And I told them they do exist. The problem is the elder women, the older women, are not teaching the younger women anymore. Well, the younger women don't want to learn from the older women because they probably think they got it all together. It would do us good to get back to the Bible it would do us good we all have a role we all have a place but I have to deal with something because in Matthew 5 he constantly said ye have heard ye have heard 
we have heard and the main emphasis of what Christ came to do. You know, I did not come to show up to fulfill it. We got it. But you made emphasis on the change that he was making in the midst of all of that. And you went to, you know, the silence. The silence deals with teaching men. The subjection deals with having authority over. I do understand how you can miss it because I understand how you missed it with these scriptures. At first, like, I hide it, no, but I do understand because it's a mishandling and it's an agenda. I got it. That's what that deals with. When you start dealing with the family or the order of the family, which God gave you the order of the family, I've already dealt with that. And then you have the Apostle Paul referring all the way back to the beginning. The head of the woman is a man. The head of the man is Christ. The head of Christ is God. We have that. This is something totally different. Down in Corinth, you fail to mention why Paul said what he said and then reference what he said to the beginning because of what was going on in Delphi. Because of the role the woman had taken as pastor teacher and the women. You didn't mention that. That's strange. However, a statement was made concerning people don't know where we are in God. When you say we, who are you referring to? What are you saying? They don't know where they are in God. Because everyone should know where they are in Christ. If you're a sinner, you know where you are. If you're a carnal Christian, you know where you are. You know where you are. How can you be lost and not know where you are? Because if you're lost, you can, man, I'm lost. Some folks don't even want to use the word lost. They use, I'm misoriented. But you're lost. A statement was made don't argue with what you know God said. What did God say? You gave us no scripture to say what God said. We heard what Christ said, but it didn't validate what you were doing. We covered Matthew 5, 21. We covered the I-4-9, 2 2 We covered thou shalt not kill. We covered the love. But this by no means had anything to do with installing or dating. You also may mention of God called women apostles, God called women bishops, and so forth and so on. Now, what did we, uh, oh, I need to, I need to blow my nose, my son, this is about it. But we need to address that because God said what he meant and he meant what he said. He gave requisites. Requisites in the Bible. If a man desires the office of, if a man desires the office of, he must be. He. Male, he, male, he, male. Then we say, ye have heard, back in Matthew. Then the requisites fall deeper into God's protege that he taught himself who wrote over two-thirds of the New Testament. Now, why would God tell Paul something to write and not mean it. Why would he do that? Why would he contradict ye have heard back dealing with the commandments which has nothing to do with the requisites, nothing to do with the order. But why would he do that? 
Why would he teach Paul all of this? Then inspire Paul, write this. And then contradict everything. Why would God do that? He wouldn't. He must be the husband of one wife. There are requisites for these installations. The ordination are elders. You make them elders. The installations are the offices. You first got to show me what a female was ordained an elder. Yes, I salute women. I have nothing against women. I salute them. But you have to show me in the Bible where God did it or permitted it for them to be ordained. Not used, ordained. You can not be installed unless you're already ordained. We, talk, we dealt with the word elder, with bishop, apostle, presbyter, all that stuff like that. We dealt with that. So, this is when you when you start changing what God wrote. Now you land the groundwork for something else. Or your modus operandi, or you you land that for something else, of what you're going to do, seeking to do, or planning to do. It's not in the book. I, again, I'll sit and reason with anyone if you can show me in the book where a female woman was ordained an elder, was installed as an apostle was installed as a bishop because there's requisites for those installations. I have, again, I'm, I'm, I have nothing, nothing against anyone, but there's requisites. So for you to say it can be done, where are the requisites? Are you going to say now that God didn't mean, you know, if a man is that, then he must be, because he said when he said he, he meant he and she. I was you, they. We're playing. And God said, you cannot add to. Neither can you take away. There's, there's a judgment. 